Hey guys, it's Dean. Despite the fact that this is the sixth game in the series, Mario Party 6 was the first Mario Party that I was legitimately expecting to come out when it did. And despite my memories of online gaming forums during that time being foggy, I'm pretty sure this was the case across the board. When Mario Party 2 released, I'm not sure anyone expected that it would come out as quickly as it did. Or really, if there would even be a sequel at all. And then Nintendo turned right around and surprised everyone with a third game, which was a shock at the time since we thought they achieved all they could with the second Mario Party, and the GameCube was right around the corner. The pause that led us to Mario Party 4 made us question whether Nintendo was even going to move on to the next console, so when they released the fourth, we were both surprised and relieved. But then they released number 5, and all concerns about how much time it would take to release a Mario Party game on the next generation was officially out the window. As soon as 5 came out, our eyes were set on number 6. Well, at least my eyes were, and most Mario Party fan forums back then. After Mario Party 5's capsule system, Mario Party fans everywhere let out a collective sigh of relief when it became clear that the sixth title would go back to the regular shop system of the previous titles. Capitalism would prevail once again. Although I do feel the need to reiterate that in Mario Party 5 you were still technically buying the items the capsule machine was giving you, since you had to pay to use them properly. And if it wasn't an item worth spending on, you could just throw it on the board and save your money. I always liked the fact that items could be placed on the boards in Mario Party 5, and I'm glad it continued in Mario Party 6, albeit with a few changes. In the fifth game, you could basically throw any item onto the board if you wanted to even though it would often be a much better idea to just use it yourself. The sixth game cleaned up this mechanic a bit by placing items into different categories and removing your choice to place certain items onto boards, or, god forbid, use a trap item on yourself by accident, which was common in Mario Party 5. Looking at you, Piranha Plant Trap. Receiving the items has changed too. When you pass by a shop, you'll be given an option of three items to purchase, which vary depending on what place you're in and how far along the game is. Additionally, spread throughout the map are random floating orb spots that will always remain on the map and give you a random orb whenever you pass by them. They're basically this game's version of the capsule machine from Mario Party 5, except much quicker and less goofy looking. I actually like the fact that Mario Party 6 combined both item receiving systems into one, as the ability to receive random items forces players to adapt their game. Since there is a shop though, any orb you receive is yours as soon as you hold it, so you won't have to pay to activate it. Which makes sense for this game since it has item shops. All in all, it's a tried and true Mario Party system and it works really well. But I'm not gonna lie, I miss the old item minigames. Anyway, your four categories of items, which in this game are known as orbs, are green, red, yellow, and blue. Green orbs are your traditional items that you would use to benefit yourself. Basically, the mushroom, super mushroom, warp item, and whatnot. New to this game is the sluggish mushroom, which is a slow dice block and allows you to pick your number. The trick is to hit A on the number right before the one you want. So for example, if you want to move 10 spaces, press the A button as soon as the dice shows a 9. Another new mushroom is the metal mushroom orb, which protects you from any effects of trap spaces when you pass by them. I'll cover traps in a second. Rounding off the green orbs is the bullet bill which steals 20 coins from the player you pass in your dice roll, and the flutter orb which takes you to the star. The flutter orb costs 30 coins and is relatively rare but still makes an appearance enough to make its presence known. But dang, I miss the genie from the old games. Next we have the red orbs which are the trap spaces. Red orbs get activated as soon as somebody passes by them and they are single use. So they will be activated and don't require anyone to land on them. The nice thing is in Mario Party 6 you won't be negatively affected by items you throw on the board anymore so you can land on your own trap space and not worry too much about it. Another change is these orbs can no longer be thrown 10 spaces ahead of you, but instead they've capped you off at throwing it 5 spaces in front of you, but also allows you to throw it 5 spaces behind you. I think this system works better for the orbs and boards in Mario Party 6. Mario Party 5 had a whole different risk reward type system for placing items on the board, so I think it was better off for only allowing you to throw items in front of you. In any case, the red orbs in this game range from making you lose coins to moving you to another space or limiting how much you can move with my personal favorite orb being the Thwomp Orb, which stops a player dead in their track as soon as they try and pass by it. Nothing quite like placing one of these right in front of a star space. Next, we have the Yellow Orbs, which requires someone to actually land on them to activate, so if an opponent passes by them, they're safe. Due to that detail, this space will remain on the board for the whole game regardless of how many people land on them. The only way to get rid of one of these spaces is to throw another orb on it to take over. You can tell when a Yellow Orb is placed on the space because the space will turn into a 3D colored pop-out of the character who placed the orb there, whereas the red orbs contain a floaty hologram of the player who placed the trap. The yellow orbs consist of more items that make you lose coins if you land on them, but the punishment is a bit more severe and instead of just taking your coins away, they'll give them to the player whose space you landed on. The klepto orb will send you back to the start, and the remaining orbs placed will make whoever landed on them lose at least one orb and usually lead to you receiving an orb from them. The last two orbs are blue orbs, and they both serve the purpose of scaring away an opponent trying to steal coins or a star from you. The snack orb and the boo away orb. They're basically the same item, they just exist on different boards. I actually really like the item system in this title. It's the first time in 4 games that I feel like it's an item system that properly resembles what made Mario Party 2 so great. 3 was too complex and leaned too heavily on a few items, like the skeleton key. 4 had the whole mushroom apocalypse that I just didn't enjoy. 5's I liked, but it definitely was very different than Mario Party 2's. 6 on the other hand is a proper return to form and luckily that'll continue in the series for the next few games. 
Add that to the fact that the element of randomness is still brought into play by limiting you to only three items to potentially purchase whenever you visit a store, and the random floaty orbs available on the boards, and I think we have a very good item system that any Mario Party fan can appreciate. The item system in this game is complemented by the spaces on the boards too. In Mario Party 5, you really needed to get all the random and wacky capsules to open the game up, since the game relied heavily on what you would receive from the capsule machine. Whereas the orb system for 6 isn't as critical in creating those wild moments. As an example, in Mario Party 5, in order for there to be a dual space on the board, either someone would have to place it on the board or the game would have to randomly place one on the board at the start of the match, when capsules are randomly dropped onto spaces. Which means that not every game is going to have a designated dual space on the board. Mario Party 6 just straight up creates a dual space that just remains constant in its location every time you play. Likewise with the Miracle Space, which is this game's version of Chance Time. I think I forgot to mention it in my last retrospective, but this version of Chance Time is really boring and just has you hit A three times with no strategy. In Mario Party 5, whichever player was on the left side tended to land more favorable results, and I'm pretty sure that's the case in Mario Party 6 as well, although I haven't really done any research on it so it could have just been coincidental. I miss Chance Time from Mario Party 1 and 2. It's so unfortunate that they pulled away from that style for all of these games, but on the plus side that stupid pinball table died with the fourth game. Anyway, Donkey Kong and Bowser Spaces make their return in this game and they continue doing what they do, rewarding and punishing players at random or forcing minigames to win or lose stars and coins. Nothing revolutionary from landing on them, the most extreme circumstances will see DK giving you a star or Bowser taking one away. In this game, they're in the same location though. The difference is DK Spaces only exist during the daytime and Bowser Spaces only exist at night. I'm surprised it took me this long to mention it, but Mario Party 6's main gimmick is the day-night cycle. Every three turns, the boards will cycle from day to night and vice versa, and that'll cause things to be a bit different on the board. Some of the minigames also get a bit of a change depending on whether it's day or night, which is neat but ultimately not really that big of a deal. I mean, objectively, it is pretty cool that they put that kind of detail into it, but it's usually almost the exact same idea of minigame with a slight change. Despite my tone, I do like this feature, but I don't like that it's blown way out of proportion by many fans of Mario Party 6 who make it seem like this detail is what makes Mario Party 6 the GOAT Mario Party title. Honestly, I'll even go out there and say that the day-night system in general is really not that big of a deal. On plenty of boards before this game, there have been mechanics that involved a level shifting one way or another, whether it was based off someone's turn or happening space or even picking up a star. What Mario Party 6 does isn't by any means revolutionary to the formula. Even the concept of the day-night system was originally from Horrorland and Mario Party 2. The implementation of the day-night system in the boards in this game vary from board to board, but honestly, in some of the boards it's such a minor difference that it's really not that big of a deal for all these fans' minds to explode. But if there is something that should make your mind explode, it's our new character for this title, Toadette! I mean, I'm sure someone has to find her as a favorite character. I don't really spend too much time dwelling on characters because they don't really change much of the game minus the taunts and animations, but considering the fact that I play every single game using Wario, I know what it means to have your favorite character join the game. So I probably should have praised Mario Party 5 for adding Toad, Boo, and Koopa Kid a little more, but I think I was too bothered by the fact that it took Donkey Kong away in that title. 10 of the 11 characters are here to stay for the next few games, all except for Koopa Kid, who must have gotten convicted or something because around 2005 Nintendo completely shifted away from his existence and threw him in whatever vault they stored Donkey Kong Jr. in for all these years. Mario Party 6 is to this day the last time Koopa Kid was a playable character, which, I mean whatever, we have Bowser Jr. and all the Koopalings, so I prefer them anyway. Before I get to the boards, I should point out that this game was packaged with a mic you could plug in for mic minigames. I'll be honest though, I don't do mic minigames and I just turned it off in the settings. And honestly, I turn them off for any other games they show up for in the future. I'm not really a fan of talking to my games or blowing in them or whatever. The mic minigames look cool enough I guess, and if you're a fan of them, then more power to you. I'm sure they have their fans. Anyway, who's ready to talk about Towering Treetop? This is your basic first level in a Mario Party title. It's a fun board with a nice design and good music. It runs and plays the same way a standard Mario Party level is expected to play, with multiple star locations and junctions throughout. It's not a complex map, rather a simple circuit that you can make longer if you take the outer junction. You'll get slightly alternating routes depending on whether it's day or night, but it doesn't change the board too much. There is one big issue with this map that bothers me a lot more than it should I think, and it's the fact that it seems like it's really crammed together. It's a small board, and seems like every two or three turns someone will have made it back to the start again. I wouldn't normally consider it that big of an issue, but this game has varying type of board gimmicks, so it seems unfortunate that the one of the boards with regular Mario Party play is as small as this board is. I'd say this board works best for a 10 turn game, because otherwise it'll get repetitive pretty quickly. EGAD's Garage is another star hunting board. It takes the same style of gameplay and adds a bit more complexity and doesn't suffer from the same issue the last board did. The board does slightly alter from day to night, but ultimately the only real change that occurs from that alteration is being able to get to certain areas on the board a bit quicker. I like the way the board shifts during the day-night cycle, especially since they each last 3 turns, so it allows you to have a short-term plan to decide where you'd like to go. There are a few teleporting locations you can use to get around to, and some happening spaces that allow you to trade in your orbs. I really enjoy the setting of this level. 
Egad's Garage is a staple in spin-off Mario titles, and it's nice to have its quirky design and aesthetic here. Almost like a spiritual successor to Luigi's Engine Room. This might very likely be my favorite board in this title, and I know I'm praising it quite a bit, but it feels a little underwhelming to consider that this is the best board in the game. Between this and Towering Treetop, you have two decent to good boards, but nothing in the realm of great or amazing. And these are the only two generic star hunting boards in the game, which is unfortunate because if you're going to have two standard boards, they really need to be at least 9 out of 10. And I'd say that EGAD's Garage hovers around the 7.5 or 8 area. The remaining boards are what I'd consider gimmicky boards. Not gimmicky like what we've seen in previous titles, where the board simply had a gimmick, but gimmicky in the sense that some of these boards use tropes that haven't been used in any of the previous titles. We'll start with Fair Square, a board that is for the most part linear with the star always in the same place in the middle. During the daytime, the star will always cost you 20 coins, but at night the star could cost 5, 10, 30, or 40 coins depending on how lucky you are. There are quite a few gambling minigames you can also pass by that would make Game Guy proud, and a few locations to challenge your opponents for prizes as well. There's a lot going on in this board and I've seen so many people consider it their favorite of the bunch. I can see the appeal to it, but for me there's just too much going on on this board. I don't want to seem like I'm coming down too hard on it because it is fun to play, but it's fun in a similar way to how I'd find a Bowser board to be fun. Just a wild mess with lots of randomness and chance involved and enjoyable in the right setting or group of friends. It's not my favorite board, but it's not necessarily a bad board. Snowflake Lake is when things really start to shake up a bit. If I'm not mistaken, this is only the second snow theme level in the entire series. Which is funny because it almost has the exact same layout as a snow level from Mario Party 3. A giant circle around the outside with a few enter and exit points that take you towards the circle in the middle. During the night, however, everyone is stuck on the outside and can no longer move into the middle of the board. This is done because this board is completely different to any other Mario Party game you've played prior to this. Everyone starts with 5 stars and the objective is to steal stars from opposing players. Around the map there are 4 huts that hold a chain chomp and you can pay to ride them and roll some dice and steal a star from any player you pass. During the daytime it costs 20 coins to roll 1 dice block, but at night you can purchase up to 3 dice blocks costing you only 10 coins per dice. Which is why it gets super interesting at night when all the players are forced towards the outside. The board in general is really fun, but I'll admit it sways really far away from the Mario Party formula, so I'm sure that there are a lot of people who would have an issue with it. It almost feels like it belongs in the extras mode. I can only speak from my experiences within my circle of friends. This board tends to be really fun, but the one drawback is that it gets old pretty quickly and is very repetitive. It's good for a short 10 turn game I think, maybe a 15 turn one if you haven't played it in a while, but it's not really Mario Party enough, if that makes sense. Luckily, the next board brings back an old playstyle that was long overdue to make a return. It's been 6 long games since we've had a linear board similar to Mario's Rainbow Castle in Mario Party 1. But it's back here and with a lot more at stake, titled Castaway Bay. If you played Mario Party 1, you know how this goes. You take your linear path towards the star with a few junctions along the way that force you to slow down a bit and potentially let another player pass you. You do this because at the end of the path you'll either be greeted by Donkey Kong or Bowser, and they'll alternate any time a player gets a star or lands on a specific happening space. If you arrive and DK is waiting, you'll get to buy a star for 20 coins. Standard stuff. But if you get to Bowser, he'll actually steal a star from you instead, which is brutal. If you don't have a star, he'll settle for taking 20 coins. In Mario Party 1, Bowser used to steal 40 coins as a punishment, so the fact that he steals a star now is pretty bad. This is because losing 40 coins to Bowser, despite being worth 2 stars, still sends you all the way back to the beginning in hopes of building up some coins to make it back to the end to increase your star count. But if he's taken a whole star away from you, your journey not only ends with nothing, but you also end up significantly worse off just for making it there at the wrong time. The punishment is hilariously brutal. You already wasted a good portion of the game just making it to the end, so returning to the start without a star for your efforts and a lower coin count is punishing enough. Losing a star is just mean. This is the kind of board you really only enjoy if one of your friends keeps getting screwed over and losing a star and gives the rest of you a chance to point and laugh at their misery. Which, I guess, is what Mario Party is all about. The last board is my least favorite. Clockwork Castle is a big circle with random junctions that allow you to move left or right for a few spaces before bringing you back onto the main path. You and your opponents take turns rolling your dice, and when you're done, DK will roll a dice block, or sometimes two dice blocks, and move around as well. The gimmick here is that during the day, you move in a clockwise direction and try and catch up with DK or hope that he rolls his dice and passes by you. Either way, if you and DK pass one another, you get a chance to buy a star off of him for 20 coins. At night, things get dark though. DK is gone and now if the fifth dice roll goes to Bowser, and the moving direction of the board is reversed. You want to avoid reaching Bowser or having Bowser reach you during the night because if you pass each other, he'll steal a star from you or 20 coins if you don't have a star. I have similar issues with Bowser stealing a star here as I did in the last board, so I won't go into that again. But the reason why I enjoy the last board a lot more than this one is because the luck versus skill balance is tipped a little too much in luck direction with this board, so it knocks it down a few pecks for me. 
The game is not only decided by your dice rolls, but also by the dice rolls of Bowser and DK. There's definitely an element of fun to be had here, but not as much as the other five boards in my opinion. The biggest compliment I can give to Mario Party 6 is that I don't think there are any boards that are not worth playing. None of them are bad and need to be skipped, which is a first for this retrospective series, but at the same time I don't think any of them knock it out of the park either. They all hover somewhere between mediocre and good as far as I'm concerned. Egad's Garage, Castaway Bay, and Snowflake Lake are probably the ones that I enjoy the most from the bunch, but none of them make me super excited to play like the other games in the series might. Luckily, the minigames here, as usual, are very enjoyable. Mario Party 6 has this funny reputation of being a game with great boards and bad minigames, and honestly I just don't see it. It almost feels like this is something that was just made up by the fanbase as a response to the people who said that Mario Party 4 was a game with bad boards and great minigames. There has yet to be a Mario Party game where the minigames aren't legitimately fun. Every title has some killer minigames and some terrible ones. But as a whole package, each game does a good job at making the minigames an enjoyable experience, and that's no exception when it comes to Mario Party 6. None of the 4 player minigames are bad, and I'd say they did a very good job to make sure they're all different enough. There's 13 of them, and I can genuinely say I enjoy every one of them, and I don't get annoyed at the prospect of playing any of them. I often hear complaints about the controls of Motown, but you eventually figure it out after your first time playing. And while it might not have my favorite control scheme, it's a fun crutch given to everybody so I'm okay with it. The 12 2v2 minigames don't shine quite as bright though. They have a few very fun ones and a few really bad ones in there, and some of them even get a bit repetitive and compare to one another. They're all properly balanced, but there's more than one in there that I feel rely a bit too much on luck, which is a bit unfortunate since I usually really enjoy the 2v2 minigames. As for the 1v3 minigames, it's pretty much what you've come to expect. 11 minigames, mostly unbalanced, still fun. Feels like every Mario Party retrospective, when I get to the 1v3 minigames, I basically just repeat myself. I'm not sure if it's just my experience, but it seems like the unbalanced minigames largely favor the 1 over the 3 with the exception of 1 or 2 minigames. On a positive note, the battle minigames are great. Probably 5 out of 6 of them at the very least. The one exception being Insectoride, which is definitely unbalanced and only takes a few turns to realize the Grasshopper is the best machine, or potentially the Ladybug if whoever is using the Grasshopper isn't very good and you're a really good button masher. It's a good minigame in theory, but in practice doesn't do so well in my opinion. The other 5 are all different enough to be enjoyed on their own. And as per usual, there's one that just has a tad bit of luck in there for all that Mario Party battle minigame gambling glory. The biggest downside here though is the fact that the developers insist on not having battle minigame spaces and rather let the battle minigame occur randomly in lieu of the 4 player minigames, just like they did in Mario Party 5. As far as the dual minigames go, I don't have a ton to say about them. There's 15 of them which is surprisingly a large amount, but I guess with the new dual minigame space it makes sense. They're fun and made even more enjoyable when considering stars can once again be gambled on in those minigames, so it really turns up the heat. Also, can someone explain me why nobody hates on Pitfall? It's literally the exact same minigame as Get a Rope. Actually, it's worse because if you both choose incorrectly, the game will just casually pick one of you to be the winner. Seems to me like the only reason Get a Rope gets more hate is because it's part of Mario Party 5, but I don't know. Three DK and three Bowser minigames are here and they're acceptable. They're not very common, so having three is probably enough, and they're not bad minigames by any means, so they always add a nice twist to the fun. It's funny that it took me critically playing through this game and writing a whole retrospective on it to finally understand why I've always scratched my head about Mario Party 6. I always had this sense of not understanding why it was so beloved by the fanbase, while also not quite understanding why it didn't appeal to me as much as it did to everybody else. And I think I finally understand why. Mario Party 6 has virtually nothing negative about it. Most of my criticisms while playing were either nitpicks or implying that the worst of it was inoffensive. This is why Mario Party 6 is so loved. In 5 you had the capsule system, in 4 the mushroom system, in 3 the frustrating board mechanics and item system, in 2 the simplistic nature of an early title in the series, and in 1 the ruthlessness. You can't really pinpoint anything absolutely wrong with Mario Party 6 as easily. The major critique of those who dislike this title is largely considered to be the best aspect of Mario Party 6. That being the fact that only two boards are what most would consider standard Mario Party boards. Lovers of Mario Party 6 will tell you that the four other boards add variety and make the game that much more enjoyable, and honestly, they might be right. Before I do this, let me just say that this is easily my third favorite title of the first six. You're not going to see me throw it down as low as Mario Party 4 or say that it's in line with 3 and 1. If 2 and 5 are tied for first place at the moment, 6 would be second. Which I know is absolutely blasphemous to a lot of you, but hear me out and feel free to disagree with my reasons. A Mario Party title needs quality Mario Party boards. Actual Mario Party boards. All the quirky boards with various objectives are cool and all, but you have got to give the fanbase the bread and butter of Mario Party before getting all creative with your style. At the time of release, I get it. Hudson Soft wanted to do something different and we're in a damned if you do, damned if you don't position. But now, today, as a retrospective? It's hard to look back at Mario Party 6 and see that it's clearly missing its Spaceland, or DK's Jungle Adventure, or even its Toy Dream. 
Boards that exemplify what a Mario Party title is meant to be and do a pretty good job at it. They don't have to be the best, but they have got to give you that vibe. Something that Towering Treetop and Egad's Garage are missing per my critiques earlier. If you're going to get creative with gameplay style, the two generic boards have to be better than this. And I don't think I'm being unfair in saying this either, because you'd be hard pressed to find many people who play Mario Party 6 for these boards, nor will you find many tier lists online who hold them as high as they do the other boards in the series. Which should stick out even more when you consider that Mario Party 6 is one of the most popular games in the franchise. Without a couple of 9 out of 10 boards to carry the title, it makes all the funky boards lose some value. And the other boards themselves aren't even flawless. They all have their drawbacks, even when you hold them to a separate standard as a different type of gameplay. So yeah, Mario Party 6 might not be a game with tons of negative drawbacks, but it's also not a game with anything absolutely remarkable to make it really that great. The Day-Night system isn't some amazing system that carries the series into new heights. It's just a neat little side gimmick that honestly streamlines the creative aspect of the boards just a bit too much. You now know something will always change every three turns and it takes just a bit away from each board's uniqueness. Like I said, this game for me is just under Mario Party 2 and 5, both of which I really enjoyed. I feel like this review makes it seem like I don't enjoy number 6, which is not the case at all. I just don't think that it's the best like many other people make it out to be. Before I go, I wanted to apologize for the long wait since my last video. It's been a very hectic few months and it's going to get a bit more hectic for me, but I'm committed to finishing the series up within the next few weeks. I have all my footage ready to go, so it's just a matter of being able to sit down and crunch through these videos, which I'm hoping to do so over the next couple of weeks because I really want to have the series wrapped up with Mario Party Superstars by mid-November. The best motivation for me is when you comment on my videos, please continue to do so. And if you're new around here, your click of the subscribe button basically means you're my new best friend, so give it a shot. Either way, I'm about ready to get started on Mario Party 7 and hopefully should have it out a lot quicker than I got this video out, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, Dean out.